So welcome, and hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Okay. So the overall theme of this presentation has to do with what you can do with Canvas data to uh, take a look at your MOOC, your course design, and make changes to have more student engagement, uh, a, a more robust course design. So we're going to start with some basic questions that faculty will ask about MOOCs and what they should do with their course. And then we're going to go into looking at some tools that are available for you to gather data about your course. And then we're going to discuss how you can use that data to inform your course design to get more student engagement. So we had introductions, but just to review, uh, just briefly, I am Jane Esco with the Canvas Network team with Instructure. I've been with Instructure a little over two years, but I do come from an academic background, higher ed, as well as secondary ed. And Jing Chi is with Dartmouth College, and she, again, is a learning analytic and LMS specialist. She has created a course on Canvas Network, and this presentation is based on her results and things that she found, and she's sharing the tools with you today. So that's kind of an exciting thing. You come away with some great tools that you can use. So Canvas Network, for those who don't know, Canvas Network is Instructure's open online course platform, the MOOC platform. It's a service that we provide for free, so anyone take, can take a course for free. Anyone can offer a course for free. And if an institution or instructor wants to offer a public large enrollment course, then you can partner with us and we provide instructional design support as well as a listing enrollment page for you to enroll your students. So you don't really have to do anything and it's all free, which is another exciting thing because how often does that happen? So this is the homepage for canvas.net. And what our mission is really is to promote openness and innovation in education. Uh, the website is down there at the bottom for those of you who don't know what that is. Now, we have been in existence for about five years and we have just reached our one millionth enrollment, so wonderful news for us. We have a large group of faculty and we're pushing for 1,000 courses. So, um, that would be real exciting to meet that this year as well. So why offer a course on Canvas Network? Well, there are a couple reasons. Excuse me a minute. This higher altitude is really um, kind of powerful, isn't it? Um, research. Maybe you are a doctoral student and are doing research on teaching and learning you can offer a course on Canvas Network. Maybe there's a program of study that you want to do a comparison with uh, traditional learners and uh, adult learners. You can use Canvas Network to do that kind of research. Maybe do it through a grant or bring in some research partners with you to do that. This is a great way to do it, not in your academic course, your accredited academic course. You can do those things outside of there. Another reason why we get people coming to Canvas Network is just for innovation and experimentation. If you want to use a t new technology or you want to try a new teaching method, um, you can do that. Canvas Network is like a giant sandbox. So if you have ideas and want to try something new and don't want to do it with your course at your institution, then you can come to Canvas Network and do it. We're more than happy to work with you on that. And the last thing that is very popular amongst our Canvas Network clients is the fact that you can promote a new program or a new curriculum. You can reach out and get yourself out there and make your name more exposed. Uh, thinking about a course that could reach a large number of people that's not just focused on your institution, but is focused on a large, large group of people. So three great reasons why you might want to think about coming over to Canvas Network to try new things. 
So as I mentioned earlier, Jing has offered a course on Canvas Network, Analytics and Course Design, Leveraging Canvas Data. And that course is on canvas.net now. You can go to canvas.net and enroll in it and go through the course. It's open-ended, so you can take your time and finish it. Or you can go to the Canvas Commons. Everybody know what Canvas Commons is? Yeah? No? Canvas Commons is another aspect of Canvas where people take their courses or their modules and upload them to the Canvas Commons, then other people can come in and pull those down. They can pull down a full course, and you could have a full course. There are people that are looking at education from an open perspective. They want to share what they're doing. So you can pick and choose the parts of their course that you find useful to yourself. So this is available on Canvas Commons if you wanted to download it. OK, I'm going to turn it over to Jing. She'll talk a little bit about those tools that'll help you gather data. Okay. Um, so we developed, Dartmouth uh, developed a uh, um, course through the Canvas network. And it's an open, um, self-enrolled, uh, free pace. So all the users who enrolled in the course can complete the course at his or her own uh, convenience. However, for self-paced course and open enrollment, I'm always afraid that the students will just click on the home page and then never come back. So I tr I'm trying to um, gather the questions that are related to course design and the students' engagement. And then I try to identify the data the Canvas learning data that may help answer some of the questions. And then we build two self-service tools that analyze and visualize the data and present the results to faculty or um, course designers. And course designers and faculty can then apply the results, hopefully, to improve the course design and um, engage students' learning. And then feedback to the learning data and go through this loop. So today, we are going to focus on two examples. There are so many Canvas data, learning data, that we can harvest and analyze. Um, but today we are going to focus on two examples, which are the most commonly asked by our faculty and uh, Canvas network faculty. The first one is, how do my students navigate through my course? Um, and uh, where do my students exit, like leave the course? So those are the two uh, common questions and we can use Google Analytics to answer the question. We also built a self-service tool that answers the same question, but um, because Google Analytics is much more easy to use and straightforward, so we are going to use, I included the link to the tool that we built uh, for your reference, so you can experiment but today, we are going to show how to use Google Analytics to answer the question. And the second example will be the discussion uh, forum data. Okay. So this is a user flow diagram chart. And uh, this, I don't think it's a, so this is a home page, the course home page. And this tells me through the first glance that how many students exit right after the click of the home page and didn't proceed or navigate other pages. Um, thankfully, 21%, so it's less than half users actually left the course after they clicked on the home page and the more than 70% continued to navigate through the, the, the course. 
and the first interaction allow me to see where students go, where are the students most likely to go after they enter the course. Because it's a self-paced, it's not a structured weekly or module. Uh, it is actually a module, but the students can click on each module. The module has no sequence, and the content within each module are sequential. So, and then this um, user flowchart I gathered through last year, it's about a year worth of data. And this show me the home page is relatively um, effective to have students navigate through the course. Behavior flow, if you go to Google Analytics, behavior flow chart would be the chart you, you can um, leverage to generate this sort of data. And next is funnel visualization. And to use funnel visualization, you will need to set a goal of the course. You need to know which is the page that you want students to go to, or, or um, course navigation menu on the left side, and which click you want students to go to, and whether your students actually ever clicked on that button or go to that page. And I want to see whether students ever clicked on the mod module course navigation. And talking about the course module, the home page we designed include all the modules uh, with a tab on the main page. Um, I spoke with, consult with Jane, whether I should set the module course navigation visible to students. Makes sense? If you know the canvas, you can make the navigation manual, module navigation manual visible to students. Uh, initially, I thought I leave it invisible, set it hidden. So in that way, I think the my assumption is students will have to click on the, the tabs that I designed built in my homepage. However, Jean suggests to me, don't uh, make it hidden, make it available. Students kind of uh, like to know the module if your course is based upon the module design. So I let it open. Um, and also for my own research curiosity, I want to know whether students actually ever click on that uh, navigation menu because I already gave a clear, I think I already provided a very clear, clear structure about the each module on the home page. And to my surprise, or uh, not really to my surprise, um, almost 59% of the students after they go through the home page and they went to other pages, they always go back, click on the module navigation tab. So, and directly click on the, right after students get on the home page and 31% directly click on the module course navigation manual, navigate the course through that way. And total 59% came back, clicked on that course navigation. So that make me, that actually confirm Jen's suggestion, leave the course navigation, the module course navigation uh, on, visible for students. Okay. okay, so let's talk about what you do when, when you have your data and how do you transfer that over to your course design and what do you do to make that happen? So we're gonna look at the three more specific questions that 
faculty will ask. And this is not only for Canvas Network, but I think faculty ask these at institutions as well, academic institutions. So we'll look at first, how should the course page, homepage be designed so that users will continue into the course, that they don't get confused. And what we, we discovered, and this was done by uh, the research on this, not only Jing, but also with Instructure itself. Several years ago, we had done a, a research study on what makes an effective course homepage and what makes people come back. And it's in one word, simplify. The simpler, the better. So in your left navigation menu, you might want to just have the basic modules that they'll need so they don't get confused about where do I go. What do I start with? There is some visual engaging things in there so that a, a picture about the topic that you're teaching is very helpful and is engaging for the students. For new learners coming in, many times they don't know what they want to do. Where am I supposed to go? I've never used Canvas. Where do I start? So you have that nice prominent button that says start here, and it takes them to the orientation materials and introduction materials for the course. And then you have the visual elements that take you to the different modules. That's for your returning learners that are coming back and want to pick up where they left off. But it's very, very simple. And I think that probably the most controversial is that left menu. Because you have people that are split in what they think about what should be in that left menu. Some feel it should be just basic to get them started. Others think that it needs to have everything on there so students can go and click and get there right away. But that does tend to promote confusion, so you have to be very good at explaining and giving instructions when you do have all that information there. So it's kind of a trade-off. So another thing you can do is to think about your course in a different way. Okay, so maybe you're teaching a history course. This example is the history of Boston. And it's natural to take a history course and do it chronologically from early times to modern times. But what if you switched that up a little bit? What if you made it a topic structure and did maybe a timeline type of module within that topic? It changes it up just a little bit, makes the student look at the, the content a little differently, and it may just make it more engaging for the student. So maybe think about that structure a little differently. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I want to add one thing. We did, um, done a re uh, we did a research on whether this structure how students navigate, how students navigate versus this structure. And what we found out, if you organize chronologically order, students tend to click based upon the one, two, three, four. So if because it's that, uh, most of the course are sequential and uh, faculty would like to use this versus this because if it's a sequential. If a course is not designed sequential, sequentially, and you, you probably should choose this, otherwise students will still assume that the content are sequential. Thank you. That's true. We find that in Canvas Network that the numbering of the modules or ABC or something like that kind of triggers something in the students to take it through in that sequence. But just something to think about. Now, the other thing, one of the big questions, and the research that Jing did didn't necessarily show this. Um, you'd have to do some more data mining to get some good information. But this is a common, common question. What's the difference between self-paced and uh, instructor-led from a course design perspective because it is very different and we get people coming into Canvas Network that are taking a traditional ag academic course and putting it onto Canvas Network in a self-paced format and not really understanding the type of things you need to have if you're going to do a self-paced course. Now, instructor-led has hard deadlines, start date, end date, end date, a lot of instructor interaction, 
um, a lot of feedback and a lot of varied feedback, audio, video, text feedback. Um, learners go through the course together because everything is timed, as opposed to the self-paced where it's totally self-directed and users, a lot of users actually, if you think about MOOC learners, they're very different in, in many ways from the traditional learner in the academic courses. They have various reasons and goals for taking these, these uh, MOOC courses. They're going to pick and choose the things that they want to do. They're not going to do everything. Uh, so you want to make sure the course is entirely open when you do this. It's very nonlinear, so they can pick and choose the things that they want to use. Very little, if any, instructor interaction. So it's important that you provide very, very detailed instructions so they know how to do things because they won't have a resource to get feedback from if they have questions. And one of the things that we found, it's a small thing, but we found it works very well with these self-paced large enrollment courses is the use of module requirements. And that is a great way to let students see their progress. Even if you're making everything a must view item, for those of you who know what module requirements are, you can have a score attached to something or a submission, but you can have a very simple thing as must view or mark is done. The mark is done feature, the, the MOOC learners love the mark is done feature because they're not going to come in on a regular schedule because there's no deadlines. So they may wait a week or two or a month to come back in. They can see what they've done and pick up right where they left off. So it's a great tool to use in those self-paced courses. Next on to the next example. So we talked about uh, using Google Analytics to um, learn about the student's learning pattern. And next, we are going to focus on the discussion forum data. The Canvas discussion um, tool is pretty, uh, it's nice. However, there's the data, like how num the number of uh, postings, the interaction are not really, um, how should I say, easy for the faculty to see. So we um, developed a tool that allow faculty or course designers to harvest the discussion data in this very simple format. And um, I provided the link so I'm not going to here demonstrate how to uh, use this tool, but it's all self-service, very easy. And then we built a tool to analyze the discussion data interaction using social network analysis approach to generate social network diagrams um, to visualize students' online interaction. So basically, the social network diagram composed node. Here, uh, those nodes are, uh, those nodes represent the students. And the edge would be these links. The links refers to the reply um, to or from a student, the error tells you whether it's a to or from. And the size of a node refer, uh, cross bounds to the total interaction associated with that student. Okay. So we apply those approach to gather the student data and then load the data to a self-service tool, provided link here. And then the tool generate the diagram for the faculty. So one is a social interaction. This one is community detection. Basically, it's suggest using the data to suggest the faculty what are the subgroups that are formed by the students' online uh, discussion interaction data. 
So just go through very quick. And uh, this would be one example of the um, social network diagram. And those are the nodes. Now we add the size of the node. So from this, which student, if each node represents a student, could you see very clearly which students are kind of uh, active compared to others? So these two. However, look the edge. Which one you think would be considered passively involved? Or we call it a S40. Um, it's probably too small to see the error. S40 received a lot of replies, but didn't provide any response to his or her peers. So this diagram tell you quickly, although student S40 and student 2 both are active, however, the active, the nature of act, the being active is different. And uh, student two seems to um, be more actively involved to provide a response to his or her peers, while student 40 seems to passively involved, just receive the replies, but didn't really provide much interaction the other way. So just, and this is a um, community detection and from this, you can identify, identify some isolated student. They use the same set of data. And you can see as student as 32 seems pretty isolated. And these two students, student 28 and the student 35, seems to um, become a very um, sub, subgroup between themselves. So it's just uh, telling you how to read this data. Okay. So these are the questions that faculty will ask. And using your data, you can decide how you want to adjust your course design. We're, we'll talk about the frequency of posts and how the quantity or the quality of posts differ from the frequency, which posts generate the most discussion, and then the question that everybody always has, no matter what kind of class you're teaching online, is how do I generate more activity, more excitement in my course? Get users more engaged, build a community. So these are some suggestions that um, we have shared with the Canvas Network faculty, and uh, I've talked about a few of them, but I'm going to start with the middle, with the instructor involvement. Instructor involvement, um, if you are doing an instructor-led course, is very important. Um, but in the discussions area, it doesn't mean necessarily quantity of posts. It's more quality in what you do with your posts. One way that you can really build a lot of community within your discussions, no matter what kind of course you have, is to personalize it, is to be conversational and be human as an instructor, because that makes the connection with the student. So that gets to be really kind of important. Uh, we find that the um, students talk to each other less when the instructor talks more. They're starting to talk, they talk to the authority figure and the one who's giving them the grade rather than connecting with the classmates. So the idea is to personalize your involvement, um, make your activities real world and authentic for the students so they can apply the knowledge that they have and they can share and do provide feedback to other students. It's a great way to do peer review in the discussions because that's another community building activity for them. So the one thing that we found that whether, no matter what reason a student is in a MOOC, 
the one thing they do love is the ability to network with someone else who is interested in what they're interested in. So they will tend to go off and build their own conversations in their own little groups. And that's how your community building happens. You let them talk to each other. You don't have to tell them everything they need to know. You can let them discover everything they need to know. Another thing that is very, very valuable in the MOOC platform, especially if you're self-paced, and that is um, providing a lot of reflection and self-check activities. They're not getting feedback from an instructor, so they want to check their learning, check their knowledge, and that is important in these, these type of activities. So at this point, we talked about our examples. We're gonna open it up for a couple questions. We have a few minutes, I think. And uh, we've got, the, the presentation has been uploaded and posted, so you can download it. It's got all the links. This is all the information that Jing has provided with the different tools. I see everybody's phone up, so that's great. Before I move on. Are we ready? Good, yes, no? And then these are the more MOOC resources, how you can enroll in a Canvas network course, how you can download Jing's course, and how you can offer a course if you want to offer a course on Canvas network. So do we have any questions at this point? Anything anybody wants to know more about, the tools or Canvas network? Oh, Jing wants to show something, so. So um, as you are thinking about as you are thinking about the questions, um, I want to demonstrate the tool that we discussion interaction tool that I mentioned. Also, if you happen to go to the course, all the tools that I um, mentioned here are included in the course. And those are all the cloud-based. We use R, build the R is a statistical package. And we use R, build the, the tool, and then upload it to the Shani, Shani server. So anyone, it's open source, you can use it. And once you go, you can browse to lo upload the data that you downloaded using um, the, the, the tool that I also mentioned, using a user script. And this would be the graph. And you can look at the individual student interactions to select individual student interactions. And this show you how the interaction, com the individual students interaction compared to the whole group. And you can also select different groups, uh, different topics, a different forum. And this compare, as Jean mentioned, uh, the different prompts may facilitate or uh, different prompts may, um, may be related to the student's interaction activity, you can use this diagram to compare the two discussion um, forum. And this is a way, this has more self-reflection. That is after the instructor's involvement. So you can actually see, confirm what Jin mm -hmm. just talk, talked about when the, when the instructor tend to provide a response, students become more um, self-reflective, re re reflect upon their own posts instead of interacting with peers posting. And also, it included some uh, text mining, gave you a little bit um, idea about what are the content that students, the postings and topic whether students are actually posting and some sentiment analysis, the positive, negative sentiment. And more would be here, this one you can, faculty can easily use to find out the interactions, how many numbers, and uh, total send word count, how many words count we want to. We have a lot of research questions raised by the faculty, like whether the student's initial thread, the, the, the total word count, affect the replies. And so faculty can use this data to do some further research analysis. 
These are some great tools that, that Jing has put together that make doing this research on your course so simple. Um, and you can learn a lot rather than relying on your, your gut intuition or something. You can get actual data to really understand what's happening in your course and then make adjustments as you go along. Very, I love that question. What based upon our student data and based upon two uh, big courses, and we found out there is a sweet spot that the word count um, meet 300 or I'm not uh, quite sure, but based upon our study, if the student posted too, too much words, can to get less reply. If the student put too little, and also it's related, somewhat related to the topic. Topic. So yeah, we did the, uh, um, this is a sample data, so it may not really, um, it may not really tell you, may not show much pattern, but you can use a scattered plot and some correlation analysis. Can yes, you? our faculty also raised a similar question, but this because we don't, uh, grades is considered uh, confidential, right? So we, um, um, faculty cannot, uh, uh, faculty can do the research themselves, but I cannot get too much involved in grades. We also have faculty did the gender for each group, look at the gender and the grades, so yeah. The tools themselves? Not the tools, it's the course itself. The, the course, it's free. And you download it from um, Canvas Commons, or you can go to canvas.net and enroll in the course. Yeah. I'm, I'm we not a... We put up a course. Oh, yes. We go into the network, right? We want to put a course in. Is it a standard course that sits out there in the network versus our instance? Is there a way to tie it to that, or is there a correlation? Good question. She asked if the, the course on Canvas Network are tied to their own instance of Canvas, correct? Um, no, they're not. Canvas Network is its own instance. Users have to create their own lo unique login. They can't use, yeah, they can't use the login from their institution. Yes. Good question. It, it has to do with topic structure of a course. And it, it is, we have found that it is beneficial if you have a similar structure in each module. So if you're doing that chronological thing within the topic, then it should be consistent all the way through. So that consistency gets to be very important. But it is good to have it. Um, in that chronological format and be consistent. It's kind of like a, I don't know, yeah, exactly. You're just tilting it on its side a little bit. I don't know how else to describe it, so. Exactly. Yes, if you do it in the topic order, then do a chronological within the topic. And you kind of have like a mini section based on the topic. Well, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you stopping by.